the school, so like, what is our responsibility to clean up like, garbage and stuff? Uh, we should pick up, because we're decent human beings, we should pick up that garbage. But I mean like sweeping and mopping and stuff? No, we have no such responsibility. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to our session. Hey, oh. Sorry. Are, we, are we filming? Oh, I'm live streaming, but are you guys filming in this one? No, no, we're going to move out. Yeah, I don't think they're in yeah, this okay. one. Oh. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session. Um, and we are from Butte County. Um, and uh, uh, you want to just do a couple rounds of introduction? Hi, my name is Mel Figueroa. I uh, just moved to Chico just a few months before the campfire happened. It's the um, deadliest, most destructive wildfire in California history. Um, I am a. Okay. Um, I think we might have. Can we disconnect this guy? My name is Steve. But, yeah, Are you done? Yeah, go for it. Go for My it. name is Steve Breedlove. I've lived uh, on and off in Butte County for, uh, I guess, over a decade. Um, mm -hmm. And I live there and I'm raising my family there. I'm a certified permaculture designer, so I interact a lot in the food sovereignty space, um, but also have been more recently working on the housing space as it's kind of an um, uh, intersection between the kind of like right wing reactionary politics and. Uh, in, 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 a, in a desperate need, even before the fire, which I'll share on my video. Uh, Chamai Toshi Chima Impa Yamoka, my all Muto Wea Amanda, Namako Yawi Wea Kama of Butte County, Yawi. So I'm saying, hi, my name is Mountain Lion Waters. Um, I'm from uh, Butte County. Uh, we're on Weot land. Thank you, Weot people, for allowing us to be here. Uh, I was raised in Paradise, California. Um, uh, my dad, we owned, uh, I spent the majority of my life in Megalia and, and Paradise, which are basically like sister, sister cities up there. Um, my family is Norwegian and Swedish on my father's side, and I'm Kashaya Pomo Indian and Chamorro from Guam um, on my mother's side. Our traditional territory is the watershed of the Russian River, which is north of Jacob Bay, or Shokok. South waters to us because it's the southernmost uh, part of our territory. So, South waters, Shokok, is our watershed. Um, yeah. Um, I'm happy to be here today to talk about this because we're only going to see more um, disasters because of climate crisis as time goes along. So the more people that are aware and are making preparations versus just responding to a crisis, uh, uh, the better off we're going to be able to handle the disasters that are coming our way. So thank you. Sorry, our, our other guest, our other is, guest is here, but yeah, she couldn't come today, but um, she's on Skype, but she can't hear what's going on in the room, so I'm just calling her to let her know to introduce yourself. Allie? Um, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a second. I got it. I got it. Okay, go ahead. So you can hear me? Uh, feedback. Feedback. <laughs> okay, try now. Um, and, um, and also, um, 
We did try and work the tech issues out and thought we had it figured out this morning. So. Okay. Hey, Allie. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to um, call you on your computer. Okay. Let's uh, try that again. Right. Sorry. Technical difficulties. We wanted her to go first, but for the interest of time, Mel, do you want me just to click? Um, hold on. I'll, I'll uh, yeah, because she was on her phone, Skype. Mm -hmm. I think that's what was going on. Uh, wait, try it out. Go ahead. I can't hear you, but if we stay on the phone, can You're you good. see me and hear me on the Skype? Yeah, you are great yeah. right now. Okay, so go okay. Ahead. do your introduction one more time. Okay, so my name is Ali Meadows Knight. I'm a Machupta tribal member, the Machupta Indian tribe here in Chico, California. I work for traditional ecological knowledge teaching children, um, basically the bare basics of what I've learned about plant and ecosystems. I have a program called Kids and Creeks, and I also uh, do a lot of panel talking and community work regarding traditional ecological knowledge. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, uh, just a brief overview in case you have been living under a rock for the past six months and don't know about the campfire, just a brief overview. Uh, the campfire, of course, ha uh, began on November 8th, 2018. It was part of a string of wildfires, of course, that hit the state, and there was a big one in Southern California at the same time. It began with downed power lines, those are PKP, that uh, failed to maintain their infrastructure. Um, it was the deadliest and most destructive fire in California history, with over 12,000 structures destroyed and 86 people dead. Um, it wiped out effectively a town of Paradise, California, a town of 27,000 people, 90% of the town was destroyed. It also destroyed several small foothill communities um, surrounding Paradise. Um, with, uh, at the time, there were 52,000 people that were evacuated, and long term, about 25 to 30,000 displaced. So um, I'm gonna throw it to Allie again. She's gonna talk a little bit about, yeah. She's only made it back so far. It's not perfectly done. The water's oh, yeah. Oh. yeah, the water the, yeah, the water is contaminated. It's gonna take yeah. about two to three years yeah. to um to fix the water system. And so there's so. people living there though that yes. didn't get burned out? Well there's, there's houses. There's houses oh. and then there's there's a there's a, Steve will talk about yeah, that situation. Um so Allie is gonna talk a little bit about um, the history of the area um, and some of the experiences she had before the campfire and also about traditional ecological knowledge. Take it away, Allie. All right, thank you. Um, I don't know if any of you are a big fan of Naomi Klein's, but um, she does talk about um, disaster capitalism and the shock doctrine. And part of what it is a shock is um, in a community is to raise history. So I'd like to revisit that history that we have in this area. California in this area is only 180 years colonized. So the history here of colonization drastically changed the narrative of how our ecosystems were managed. Basically, based on the colonization that we were encountered, what happened was our ecosystem and the people that prepared, took care of the ecosystem, were removed, extinguished, or shut, sculptured. And then the continue, uh, to continue that, the history of those people and how they take care of, took care of the land was also uh, tended to be erased. So traditional ecological knowledge um, became uh, something that I was able to teach children. But eventually, being able to teach children, you have the capacity eventually to teach adults. So when we come upon teaching uh, the community of Butte County, I work with Don Hankins, who is a geography professor at Chico State. He's also Miwok. And so we were able to uh, work together and build some community bridges uh, learning techniques for uh, fire management. We had also, uh, Don Hankins had done a sabbatical in Australia and had learned from the Aboriginal community there how to also um, manage uh, their, 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 uh, their ecosystems using fire, their traditional knowledge. So when we began teaching, we did some films, we began teaching, we had gone to different areas and said, look, there's federal funding, 
to the state of California, to uh, forest management systems and said, hey, we have traditional ecological knowledge that fire, putting fire down on the off seasons and using it as a management tool for large scale land management, they were just like, no, that would cause a forest fire. We're not really interested in creating more of a mess. But eventually, um, the it became more of an ethnocentric argument about the scientific knowledge about fire and fire management from a very, from, from my perspective, primitive understanding of, of, of this continent, of this land, without um, putting the, the knowledge that the indigenous communities from, from the East Coast to the, to the West Coast have, um, have held on to throughout the years through colonization. So um, Paradise was uh, an area that we really saw a lot of um, we really saw a lot of people no longer uh, working with uh, native communities and just doing fire suppression. And eventually, after one of these talks, we saw the um, the fire come up. And I I was literally about less than two weeks doing a panel explaining to uh, the area on the radio um, that uh, you have either you're gonna have a little bit of fire or a whole lot of fire, but having no fire was no option at all. We had to work together, perhaps uh, having more fire technicians um, working in the community rather than firefighters. Great, um, thanks Ali. Um, okay, now we're gonna go to Eric. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd second everything that Ali just said. The way colonialism uh, was put in place um, just eradicated all of uh, our traditional practices about uh, fire prevention, uh, about working um, with the land to prevent these kind of things. So, um, no, no. Sorry. you can see you see from the destruction in paradise. We're talking about 90% of all residential homes, maybe more, right? Yep. That were uh, uh, all destroyed. Um, the, the practice, uh, not only did colonialism change the landscape itself, um, but the construction of many of these cities. Uh, I was born in Santa Rosa, right? So prior to campfire, uh, Santa Rosa had a major fire just like this, right? And the way uh, the colonial structures of residential housing are put together are just uh, a recipe for disaster uh, because there's not truly designed uh, fire management uh, in the way we do housing in the United States. When these things happen, it's just utter decimation um, when these things get out of control. So uh, there's a lot to be learned from indigenous practices. And uh, it's really unfortunate that it takes something like this for us to start opening our eyes to um, the problematic uh, construction of this colonial society. So um, we have a lot to learn everywhere on this continent. You're on somebody's land wherever you go, right? So it's good to know who they are and to dig into their practices so you know uh, how to live in conjunction with the environment that you're in. And if that had taken place to begin with, if it hadn't been the genocide and it had been consideration for the thousands of years of knowledge here, uh, we wouldn't be facing these problems, frankly. So, just want to second everything that Ali said. Um, so, I pick up kind of uh, after the uh, removal, which we had uh, essentially a trail of tears that started in View County and went to the Round Valley Reservation outside of Redding, um, killing most. They don't have the exact statistics, but it was as, as brutal as the Trail of Tears that you hear about um, in elementary school. Um, but 
that I wanted to kind of talk about the structural eco economic dimensions um, that exist post-colonization that kind of uh, created, um, along with that loss of tradi uh, traditional ecological knowledge, created the perfect storm for something so horrific. Um, you know, just like uh, the, the Ternarian parade of, of, of Western um, seizure and development of, of land, um, View County started e extractive uh, and industrial, um, and then it's uh, shifted into services that's been mostly since about the 60s or 70s um, with financialization. Um, the city of Chico uh, contains over half the population, or the metro area of Chico contains over half the population of the county. The county population is only around like 225. It's probably significantly less than that now. Um, but we have the university. We also have a large medical complex. And then most of the agricultural services, so like tractor repair, financing, all that stuff is located in Chico. Um, and then just in the last couple decades, um, it's been more of a kind of a peripheral um, city to the capital complex that was the Silicon Valley. So more recently, um, we've been developing tech, um, entrepreneurship uh, uh, has led to a few large um, companies like Build.com and Lulu's, which are both e-businesses e that have large warehouse spaces and large workforces, uh, but primarily the university um, and Enlo Medical Center, um, which is the regional medical center, are, are the primary um, uh, places of employment and economic activity. But with that process of capital moving out of the Silicon Valley and Bay Area where people can't afford to live um, and moving towards a place like Chico, obviously like everywhere else has led, um, the process of gentrification has begun. Um, within that economic context, within that change, the workforce has been moved in because the workforce there was traditionally agricultural and industrial, just working class, and didn't have that special set of skills for medical education or now in, um, tech. And so the poverty rate in View County is 21%, and, and um, for comparison, the national rate is actually 14. So uh, considerably more, the poverty rate is any, uh, a family of four with two kids um, under the age of 18 making $22,000 a year. So it's virtually, um, it's not enough to survive in California, um, certainly. 61% um, of the, this is a, a California Budget and Policy Center, um, study from 2015, so the numbers are even worse now, but 61% of the people in the county were considered housing burdened, uh, which means they spend more than 30% of their income on housing, and uh, another 33%, or 33% uh, which is included in that 61%, 33 are extremely burdened, which means they spend more than 50% of their money on housing. Um, we have over 1,000 unhoused people in Chico, 2,000 in the county. Uh, we have probably closer to 12, but uh, unhoused folks are notoriously hard to count, and they only do the continuum of care count uh, on the HUD funds twi uh, every two years. Um, Chico's rental vacancy rate before the fire was less than 1%. Meaning, like, you couldn't get a rental if you could even afford one. Um, it was 3% about countywide. Right now, effectively, the rental vacancy rate is zero. Um, in the last six months, Houses have appreciated $100,000, roughly on it, 80 to 100,000 on average. Um, so now the only people who can afford them are real estate holding companies and people with really deep pockets. So we're actually losing um, our owner occupancy um, that existed within the city, even though the city before the fire had a 60 per, uh, 55 to 60% rate of rent, uh, renters um, compared to homeowners. Um, and uh, lastly, even if people could afford it, which I, I've, I've laid out that people can't really afford housing, um, the median family income in Chico is $42,000, and a single family home is almost 250% of, 250% uh, uh, more house than they can afford. So um, it, it was a really bad situation. And, uh, and then the fire happened. Um, Mel's uh, statistic of 12,000, I think, was uh, from no, shortly after the fire. Yeah, it's more and like 15. That picture has become clearer in, yeah. in the, the um, following months. And the, uh, the county housing um, authority says about 14% of the county's housing stock was destroyed uh, between the town of Paradise and the neighboring um, towns, villages, and hamlets um, that are spread all across the Foothill area. 
Um, as you can see by these charts, Paradise is the area in red, and you can see how much of the county is in wild and urban interface. That's the county. The gray area is the urban area up top is Chico. The one down in the uh, center middle um, towards the bottom is Oroville, Greater Oroville, and the rest of that is agricultural. Um, we do have an established green line in Chico, so development can't be pushed west to maintain our very fertile agricultural soil, and so it's only pushed further and further into that realm. The fire, I live in northeast Chico. The fire came about uh, two miles from my house, right up to the edge of the city. Um, they were able to cut some good breaks. There, the, uh, the terrain is easier to manage, um, and it's also grassland rather than um, heavily wooded. So as far as firefighting, uh, they were able to stop the fire before it moved into Chico, but they did make evacuations in the city. Um, and uh, I don't want to talk too long. I think I gave myself 10 minutes, and I haven't used that yet. Um, this event created a lot of uh, social disintegration. It, it initiated a process of social disintegration, or accelerated, rather, a process that was already underway due to the uh, gentrification, demographic change. Um, and so recent statistics the city put out uh, is that spousal abuse has doubled since the fire. Uh, incidences of spousal abuse, uh, incidences of child abuse have increased 83%. And uh, there's been a notable increase in elder abuse as well. So um, when we get to what um, kind of we've been postulating as, as a solution to this, healing, uh, healing that trauma, not just the trauma of the fire, but also the trauma of the legacy of, of um, you know, of, of relocation or and dispossession, uh, as well as other um, white supremacist uh, activities, the running out of, they burned Chinatown, and there's a, a really horrible history in Butte County. Um, and so, there's no housing and there's no elder or child care, which is part of what's creating this elder and child abuse stuff. Um, stuff is tense and uh, there's an inadequate medical care. Um, one thing we're dealing with is that uh, capitalism's failure opens the door to fascism, uh, even though it's also an open door to building an alternative. And so we felt it was really important to put, this is a campaign of uh, mailer that was sent out. In the top right corner is our comrade. She's one of the few women of color active in our, our social justice and economic justice spaces. And uh, if, if that's not a dog whistle, I don't know what is. Um, I'm behind the woman with the camera there and we did a protest because just like in cities across the state and across this country, there's a war on unhoused and poor folks. Um, and uh, we, uh, we staged a protest and it kind of, they, the reactionaries were able to seize on that and exploit it in a way that um, we predicted, but I think we un underestimated the scale and the level to which they exploited that to push through and get um, a woman like this elected. Um, Casey Reynolds, not the, not Kate, the No, not Kat, Casey yeah. Reynolds. Um, and uh, so, so there's another dynamic to what we're dealing with. There's this kind of crisis coming on. And so it's not just us needing to build housing and find out ways to meet our, our needs locally, but also our need to do that in the context of um, uh, fortifying ourselves against these and fighting against uh, eventually pushing back against these reactionary forces that are very strong and that are built on this, uh, the legacy of um, our, our, our city's area's history. Um, do you want to explain the Casey Reynolds ice cream fascist? Oh yeah, right, so we've been <laughs> trying to make ice cream fascist uh, a, at least locally, um, a theme. It's the, the, the kind of fascism or kind of reactionary right wing um, formations we're seeing in our city are ones that get lots of praise heaped on them by the media because they go clean the creek, but ultimately when they clean the creek, they ask the, they work with the police to remove the unhoused folks that are temporarily sheltered there, and then they go take their stuff and throw it away. So, but the image they project to the general public is that they're doing a good thing and no one can complain about picking up trash. And so we use ice cream fascists to, to describe this kind of innocuous, almost like wholesome narrative building that they're so damn good at. Um, and, uh, and, and, and describe it um, in a way that's also clever and... A sweet and safe Chico. It's the same here. To, uh, devil playground. Yep. To clarify, uh, Casey Reynolds is the owner of 
the Schubert's local ice cream oh, shop. Okay. And uh, <laughs> that's been in business for three generations. Yes. So old wait. Um, their criminalization of the unhoused and the poor uh, has just been wrapped in this this uh, sugary dressing. Um, yet it is a vile and vicious uh, demonization of uh, the economically oppressed. And yeah. Including using language like criminal vagrancy, which was the almost the exact same rhetoric and terms that they used during the Indian genocides. To, um, so it's like there's a continuity between that deep history. So what can we do about it, right? Um, okay, um, I mean, part of the um, issue is that we are dealing, uh, and, and when we talk about solidarity economy, it's it, for us in Butte County and for, for poor and unhoused people all over, um, all over the nation, there's like, you know, it's, it's, it's about resilience. It's not just about like, I mean, we, do love the you know the values of community and all of that, but but it's like the sense of the fire I think kind of really amped up the sense of urgency, right? We are dealing not only with a climate change event or a climate change crisis, and of course in fire country, right? This is not just a one time one off, right? Uh, we we will expect you know pretty much a year round fire season. We will expect wildfires, destructive, more and more destructive wildfires in urban areas every five to 10 years. And, um, and this is also compounded onto that economic crisis that she was talking about. These are a couple of pictures from uh, some of the chaotic scenes um, after the fire um, with the mass displacement. Uh, there was a Walmart in town and a big sort of a vacant lot right next to the Walmart. And was it almost a thousand people? Over a thousand, more than a thousand. Or the over first a thousand, yeah. First feeding, over a thousand people, um, you know, basically uh, made a spontaneous camp in the Walmart parking lot because, of course, Walmart allows overnight camping in its parking lots. And um, this is in Chico. And this was in Chico, yeah. And uh, and so you know, this really brought home the the thing that we don't have resilience to an event like this. Um, I mean, most of the government agencies, um, but also, you know, a lot, uh, uh, some of uh, our own networks were kind of taken by surprise by the scale of the, you know, the of the consequences of this thing. Um, you know, we have there was briefly a mutual aid network that came together called North Valley Mutual Aid um, that raised money and was really, really like it was really, really crucial in those first couple of weeks after the fire. Um, now it's five, six months later, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, like this, that formation, you know, has dwindled because of course there was a lot of burnout, right? From people doing all of that emergency work, having to create structures out of nothing, right? To try to care for all of these people. And so, you know, that got us thinking about, you know, we don't, we can't just respond to disasters. We need to adapt, we need to accept the reality of natural disasters in the time of climate change, but we need to, this is where a solidarity economy really came into focus as one way of building resilience. We need to have those caring, compassionate, mutual aid networks in place before fires happen, um, because that's, um, in, in order to have more resiliency and like less sort of trauma for people, um, as well as um, defend and, and provide an alternative, really, uh, to the type of narratives that the ice cream fascists are putting out. Yes. Okay, before you move on, though, yes. I just want to know, I see that Dan Everhart I know. reacted to that. Our comrade Dan Everhart was a tireless fighter for um, the types of uh, you know, aid and stuff, and he unfortunately uh, died earlier around Christmas, wasn't it? Yeah. So tribute to our fallen comrades. I, I would like to add something to that. To your next, uh, it's past Walmart, correct? Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, interestingly enough, so the North Valley Mutual Aid came together. This was just a, a formation of, of mostly anarchists, um, some kind of left of center socialists um, and uh, other liberals, um, primarily the more radical elements, obviously. Um, but uh, we, 
me, myself, Dan, um, two other, two or three other people walked through the camp and said, what do you guys want? Because that's the, the principle of, of mutual aid or solidarity over charity rather than just, hey, you need these things, let me give you these things. We said, what do you need? They said, um, a community space. So that's exactly what we put our minds to. We created a hub that actually was able to uh, build the profile of that enough. I think there was already uh, the elements for uh, high profile for that anyway, just the juxtaposition of the extreme capitalism of a company like Walmart versus this kind of desperate poverty um, and climate disaster that drives people to sleep in a parking lot or in a vacant lot. Um, but by creating that community space, we actually were able to hold that ground. And there was some, you know, obviously disagreement in left circles about what that meant. We said, let's hold on as long as we can. Our job is not to hold this space on their behalf, but to just pr provide them a place to make coffee, make some oatmeal, you know, uh, have a warming tent. Because, I mean, this happened in early November, and the first two or three weeks after the fire, it was a nuclear winter. Our temperatures went from, you know, daytime highs in the mid-70s to, like, daytime highs, like, in the low 60s. Like usual frost in the red, Redding area. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was a nuclear winter, like, a, a bona fide nuclear winter. It was insane. But anyway, so people are cold. We made this warming center. We put up a, an info board, and we kind of um, um, were able to help them hold their space, give them a place to come together. And it, we had no idea what the result would be from that. Um, we were doing it because it felt like the right thing to do. But ultimately, because the profile and then the national media coverage of that camp in particular got um, so high, Walmart said, well, we got to kick them out. We can't have this. Um, but we need to pony up some blood money to soften the blow. So they actually wound up giving specifically not for campfire evacuees, but to, it highlighted the, the problem of unhoused people in Chico, even pre-fire unhoused folks. And Walmart Foundation ponied up a million dollars, and we're finally going to have our first low barrier shelter, um, and it's doubling the capacity of our shelter beds, which in a city of 100,000, we only have like 150 beds for over 1,000 unhoused folks. And now we're going to double to around two, two fifty, um, in a low barrier shelter going in, so people with uh, addictions or dogs or cu couples and stuff have a place that they can go. That's what low barrier. What is low barrier? It it just means that there's no most. The other two shelters are run by religious organizations, and if you're a couple, you can't stay together. If you have a dog, if your dog gets separated and kenneled, um, and if you use alcohol or drugs, you're not permitted at all. So a low barrier shelter is let's put you in a bed, and then we'll try and connect you with the services you need to get your life. On back on track. And even with that, it's encountering resistance. Oh, absolutely, from the ice cream fascists. Yeah. Absolutely. Pretty coordinated, nasty stuff that um, is, if you look side by side with uh, some of the tactics of the black shirts um, in Italy, um, the, the, I mean, the tactics are overlap. It's, it's pretty scary. Sure. Yeah, I was curious before Walmart, you know, felt the pressure to kick everybody out and come up with money, how were they convinced? To allow to have people there in the beginning, it was just. I mean, they a, they, they have a, they have a standing policy of allowing, you know, um, like RVs and stuff, yeah. and like that's just where people went. And and for a while there was just there was no option. <laughs> like like literally a thousand people invaded this lot next door, mm -hmm. and, and they dealt with it for a while. And they had to, yeah. What well, were they like? Of course, it would be a PR disaster for them to kick out a thousand people while a fire is still burning and evacuation orders are still under uh, in place. So, um, you know, unfortunately, like that kind of PR fear actually kept the camp going for a little while. Yeah. Um, so I'm from Mendocino, um, so we've had a lot of really similar experiences in a slightly different mm -hmm. scale. But um, so I have a million questions, and hopefully we'll catch you later. Um, but I guess I was I, maybe you're about to cover this, but I was wondering if you if there's any kind of um, simple things that you felt worked or didn't in um, a, when the mutual aid network was going, and if there's sort of lessons that can be extrapolated from that for similar for other regions that are looking at the same thing. And you know, we just literally had a fire today that I was trying to cover. So, wow. you know, it's definitely here again. Um, and this fire season's looking bad. So, um, yeah. I don't, but that it seemed, I heard for sort of around the North Coast and from people in Santa Rosa that um, the work that the 
mutual aid network was doing was really effective, um, and it seemed like it was able to come together really quickly. Um, but yeah, if you could just speak to some of what Workman did in there, that'd be great. Um, yeah, um, we can. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of go through the rest of. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, but, no, no, but, but, but I'll speak to that, like, throughout okay. because a lot. I mean, our whole idea is basically came out of that experience. And the lessons so, learned. And yeah. the lessons learned. And so I, I guess just to throw that, in, and I, I don't know if, if you have time to also maybe talk a little bit about whether or not you what how you felt like the media coverage of that helped or didn't. Um, I'm familiar with your local papers and people that work there, but they are a big corporate owner. Um, oh, yeah. And yeah. so, if you have time, I'd be curious um, about that, that too. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah we'll, 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 let's, let's put that for the discussion section. I'm trying to get to the discussion Yeah, sorry, sorry. No, 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 you know, looking at it, it's not just our local problem, right? This is uh, this is a 2018 fire map, right? So this is all the fires that happened in 2018, right? Cal there's nowhere in California that is safe. Well, maybe here a little bit. <laughs> there's a little pocket, little Humboldt pocket right there. But um, but you know, this is a statewide problem. It's a problem of the West, um, and so you know, thinking about, uh, especially from that experience. Um, thinking about what resiliency means in a context of a transition to a solidarity economy, um, you know, uh, sort of thinking about the priorities, right? So number one is climate adaptation. And however we can do that, um, because this needs to happen on a large and unprecedented scale. Um, I put the Green New Deal in there because, you know, that's one uh, possible avenue to try to, you know, again, get uh, uh, some resources or an even just legitimation, right, for the kinds of stuff that Ali and Eric were talking about in terms of land management and remediation. Um, and of course, indigenous knowledge is absolutely positively key to that. Um, but the, the thing about that is, is again, the, the legitimation problem, right? Um, how we can not just get people to like recognize that that is a useful thing to do, but also because again, this is a land of private property, right? Um, uh, if you are going to have to work with homeowners, landowners, a lot of the people in these fire areas, or a lot of the property in these fire areas is absentee landowners, right? Um, and they don't care, right? So the, some people even forget they have properties, right? But the, it's going to have to work on that landscape scale. Um, environmental justice, right? Going all the way back to indigenous, not, it's not just about Right, um, you know, saying, oh, we need to be inclusive. We need to, like, you know, um, kind of. It's in this in this instance, and this is a, a perfect example of it. Right, um, justice for um, communities of color um, and historically marginalized communities, and also uh, gender justice is not just an additive property, right, to what we need to do. It is it, inclusion and justice is necessary because it helps us all survive. Right, and that's like a huge thing. Um, housing, housing, housing. Right. Um, one of these, one, one of the things that, that has kind of shaped our ideas of a kind of cooperative economy and a solidarity economy is the fact that we people need places to land. Right. Well, uh, one of the things I was going to tell the ice cream fascists was that like one wild wildfires don't give a shit. Right. How much money you have. Cancer. Right. Does not care. Right, how good of a and religious a person you are, right? Uh, lo uh, the capitalist economy does not care if you are good at your job; you can lose it at any time. And um, and so the, I, the 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 basically acceptance that people are going to move around, people are going to need safety nets, people are going to need cooperation and solidarity because it is it is something that could happen to us all tomorrow, right? And finally, um, the, the movement to democratize energy, of course, is gathering a pace, especially because PG&E, now the costs between the Mendocino fire and the Butte County fire are so much that PG&E is now in, in the verge of bankruptcy, which I'm like, yes, kill it. <laughs> Socialize the energy, right? Make it solar microgrids that aren't, that aren't a, a dependent on high voltage transmission lines, et cetera. Yes? Um, be before you move on into kind of the, the theoretical framework around what we're trying to do, 
Um, I did want to say, um, what we're trying to do is, is, is departing beyond um, the state. Um, earlier in one of the presentations, they showed a, a, a matrix of, of uh, it was a Kurdistan, a patriarchy, capitalism, and the state. And capitalist modernity is the, inter and that's what we call the intersection of those three things. Um, the state has, has just shown that it's incapable and it's opening uh, an ideological space for us to show that there's a way beyond the state and a way beyond capital to meet our needs. Um, just a couple failures to give you some context. The city of Chico finally approved, approved not one trailer on the ground, 86 units. City of 100,000, where most of the people came, they finally got 86 FEMA trailers. Neighboring communities have gotten several hundred between them. The entire county, less than 1,000 units for over 14,000 housing units destroyed. And we don't even have a thousand units from the federal government down because locally people are like, NIMBYs, nope, don't want a trailer park nearby. Mm -hmm. Even though these people were single family homeowners, they're probably middle income. They lost their job, they lost their house, now they're gonna live in a trailer, you don't want them there, right? Um, another uh, failure, the city of Chico um, produced a, an out anti-price gouging ordinance which had no enforcement, it had an 800 number that you could call if you were getting screwed, um, and that was the extent of it. And right now, people who've lived in houses for 10, 15, 20 years renting the same house, they're all getting no-fault evictions, 60-day pink slips, because the people who own that, like I said, appreciation's been 80 to 100,000 in just where I live, but citywide, like it varies, you know? So people are just cashing in. And, and people who have bought the house, say, and then moved away, but held on to the house as a rental, because it's a college town and there's a lot of poor people, so no, there's, no one really buys houses, um, or, or not as many people buy houses, they held on to and now they're getting rid of those people. So you're getting people who have lived there for 10, 20 years who can actually pay the rent, they're still getting displaced because the, the, the local, state, um, and federal authorities has not, have not done anything to um, even address secondary displacement, <coughs> let alone address the primary displacement of the fire. And lastly, uh, AB 430 just advanced our local um, Congress uh, Assemblyman um, out of Yuba City, James Gallagher, um, put up AB 430, drafted that bill, and it made it through committee and it's on its way to finance, and then it'll be on its way, or uh, the Appropriations Committee, then it'll be on the way to the full assembly. Um, and all this bill does is circumvent CEQA, uh, California Environmental Quality Act, and the requirement for environmental impact reports for development, completely eliminates the need for these developers to even assess what kind of damage they're going to do to the environment, and does, does nothing to guarantee affordability. So market prices are 100,000 above what they were just six months ago, and then all the, the only thing the state can put up is a bill that says, let's build market rate housing, so that there's 400,000, 450,000 dollar houses being built when people can't even afford a 200 to 200,000 dollar house. In a fire zone. And my fire. understanding, my understanding, I could be wrong, but what I heard was that a lot of people that were living in Paradise in that area were there because they couldn't afford to live in the Bay Area. Paradise was affordable. And it was mostly elderly, actually. It was a very, it was a retirement community, which is why out of the 86 people um, that died in the fire, very few of them were under the age of 70. But, but even it was those all elderly people that died. But even those under the age of 65, one in five were disabled. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people living on disability. Income. Fixed incomes. Yeah. Can um, I hear that? Yeah. I just wanted yeah. to chime in on these failures that we're talking about. Yeah. The failures of the state and the failures of capitalism, mm -hmm. right? Because in this country, there's a lot of talk from the corporate media that these things like seem, they want you to think they're not connected. But let's be, let's be very clear, right? The state is owned by the capitalists. Mm -hmm. Every single politician in office, every single one, the two capitalist parties are in complete and utter control of the state. And what did we see here? A capitalist corporation, PG&E, doing what capitalism does, minimizing its costs, maximize its gains, right? Mm -hmm. Neglecting the work that they were supposed to be doing, which caused this horrific event, right? Let's take a look at the state. This fire started in federal lands, right? After Trump just cut the, just totally defunded the forest industry, right? 
So in a federal forest, a capitalist corporation neglecting their, their what they should be doing, a, a, uh, a capitalist in the White House defunding the forest, forestry department, and then you said FEMA finally got these trailers, right? How long did it take? Six months, and they still haven't even put them down yet. They just approved the project like a month ago. That picture is that's Stephen right there cruising. <laughs> cruising down there, right? I took that. I took that. Okay. Um, hey, how long were we there before FEMA showed up? Weeks, right? Oh yeah, no, we were we were there at least a week before any other Red Cross or anybody else showed up. So North Valley Mutual Aid had had to come together because Red Cross was overwhelmed. FEMA was nowhere to be found for weeks. And what was happening? Trump had taken $20 million out of FEMA to give to the National Guard to go post up at the border, yep. right? For their, for their dog whistle, anti-immigration, racist border policies. They would taken $20 million out of FEMA right as this fire was occurring, right? So the capitalism and the state in this country are a joint entity, right? And that is exactly why not only did this fire happen because of capitalist neglect, just by the nature of capitalism to wanting to maximize their gains, but the state failed to show up because um, that same uh, careless and greedy and selfish uh, system and mentality is actually present in both the capitalist we need to move on. Yeah. I, I want to make one final statement that also the, the nonprofit industrial complex, the large nonprofits, did not know how to deal with this. And so this is why we're trying to develop a model that says rather than be reactive, which, which, which there's a lesson we've learned, if there's anything to take away from this, is the state and, and, and nonprofit organizations have no clue how to deal with it. So we have to be proactive right. and build an alternative right now. Um, before I go to our last slide, I want to I wanted just uh, give the floor to Allie as well to see yeah, right if there's um, anything you, you would like to add to sort of the situation and what's going on now and um, some of the issues that we're facing. I am I'm definitely seeing the pattern of looking at history and um, the resilience that's necessary that for survival is kind of predicting and having to live through the shock um, that it's our politicians, our state, are kind of inducing this shock because it has an outcome that pretty much oppresses or eliminates um, anybody in poverty and gives an opportunity for some more stakeholders to grab more property, uh, more resources. Northern California um, is a broker of water. They broker water to agriculture in Southern California and to oil companies for fracking. This is fresh water, California water, from all of Northern California and all these water reserves are there as a, um, a systematic way of draining the state system for profit. So, the idea that we're going to the idea that we're going to change all this is actually we need a crisis in order to make these these huge changes these uh, these very strong almost revolutionary type changes that the state of the fifth California the fifth largest economy in the world is going to have to uh, become a uh, a resource that's only that is able to um, to create a solidarity economy through um, the resources of Northern California, Southern California, Middle, Middle California is, is is pretty much a goner, um, and I don't know how Southern California is going to do without the water. So it's really important that we look at the crisis of climate change as an opportunity, and also um, it's an opportunity for both sides, uh, the sides for the community to make a huge revolutionary change, or it can create another. Op, you know, opportunistic uh, opportunity for capitalists to take water resources and further gentrify and bring down um, the people of the community in order to make wealth and profit. And making wealth and profit at this point is pretty much insane. Thanks, Allie. Um, so now, so what is to be done?
done, right? That's always the question. Yeah, David. Um, and so, you know, we've been doing a oh, sorry, I gotta mute the speaker here. Um, okay. Um, the the so you know this has informed all of our thinking about what can we do, and we are literally in the absolute beginning conceptual stages of of building like a cooperation model, right? It's a, our taking our we're taking inspiration um, and trying to uh, figure out how we can put a solidarity economy together. Um, so this is kind of like our. Uh, uh, sort of framework right now. Um, our ideas about what to do about it um, so far revolve around these four areas. Food, land, housing, and healing. What, does that, what could that look like in terms of projects and cooperatives that we can start up, um, projects that we can do? Um, in terms of food, one of the things that we've been thinking about is, uh, is having a ready-to-eat meal. This is also Ali's idea, so I want to give credit, but also um, the idea that because we have a lot of low-income families, we have people who maybe don't have very much in terms of kitchen facilities, we, we have a lot of people who are working multiple jobs and don't have time to prepare, prepare fresh, healthy meal, meals, and so um, Ali can talk a little bit about that too, but um, that the tribe has an industrial kitchen that um, is possible to use for, um, to just do big collaborative cooking dates and you know like make pizzas and lasagnas and kind of some kinds of stuff that um, oops there you go. she's coming back um, uh, uh, like things that we can do for low income families and so that that can provide ready to eat um, hot meals or, or frozen meals right at low cost um, that are healthy and and that kind of thing uh, we've also been talking about food production, right, permaculture, and being able to uh, both renew the land, right, because a little bit of crossover, as well as uh, be able to provide food, so like a CSA or a buyer's co-op. In terms of land, um, I, uh, and again, I'm going to throw it to Ali to speak a little bit more about this, but we're, we're all sort of, um, uh, kind of in, in wanting to uh, renew the land through permaculture, traditional ecological knowledge, and indigenous land management. Um, also, wildfire prevention through land management. One of the things that I've been uh, kind of ex uh, ideas I've been exploring a lot is goats, right? Using goats um, and and cultivating goats both for for food, for milk, for cheese, and also for brush clearing. Because especially in some of these very mountainous and hard to reach places, goats are perfect for that, right? Um, again, housing things for uh, affordable housing where people can have. Um, you know, and, and again, combined with all of this, this is all kind of interconnected, having eco-villages, co-living spaces, um, places where we can have tiny houses. One of the, the oh, well, I'll not talk about the issues right now. But, uh, but, you know, being able to modify the zoning requirements and the zoning ordinances to allow for alternative buildings, right? Earth, earth shelters that are fire resilient. Um, and also, uh, you know, mobile houses. Um, and that's another thing. You know, I'm, I'm a van lifer, and there's, uh, you know, increasingly, I mean, in Chico right now, you go to any major parking lot in Chico, you will see people living in their cars, you know, and so to have um, available space, um, not just in a disaster area, but, but for this increasingly mobile, unhoused population to be able to have somewhere to land, somewhere with, why, you know, uh, some kind of place to charge your phone, uh, some water and facilities available, showers, you know, things where uh, people, this, you know, increasingly mobile nomadic <coughs> population can have somewhere to rest, right? Um, without being harassed by cops, without being, you know, the neighbors calling, uh, like vigilantes, with, uh, you know, just that safe space to be. And of course, having um, um, mutual aid facilities in place in case of disasters and evacuations and that kind of emergency housing. Um, and finally, uh, the healing part, but uh, as Steve um, described, you know, this kind of disaster, this combined disaster is increasing trauma in our population. So um, this is where I'm actually going to throw it to Ellie to talk about the ideas in terms of um, using that traditional ecological knowledge and, and this kind of matrix 
in order to um, to provide healing for trauma. Take it away. Yeah, so I did a, a conference at Chico State called uh, Indigenous Earth Relations Alliance. And it inspired the film that was made by Chico, Chico State with TEK, Traditional Ecological Knowledge. And what I found is that when I was actually working on land restoration projects, burning, actually restoring willow patches, watersheds, that it was a personal recovery going on in myself um, that I had uh, had some self-awareness of trauma that I experienced and I had felt healing going on during this process. So I introduced this idea to Chico State and it kind of caught on that uh, the, the, the land restoration efforts are also connected to our personal restoration efforts that we go through and we actually have measurable yeah. results that we can see. And so Within looking at uh, Chico, um, the history of Chico, the history of indigenous people that were removed from the land, there was a reconciliation that can take place once you are returning the ecosystems and restoring those ecosystems as a, as a, as a reparations for the history of colonization. And that this is mutually healing, not only for the native, but for the non-native or the colonizer or those that come from colonizers that no longer agree with the principles or doctrines of manifest destiny or about the ethnocentric attitudes that come from people that look at indigenous as primitive. So the technology of, of, of creating a food system, we did this food study, we found that you could afford to feed a large family on a small amount of money based on a two week bulk food shopping spree. And those that are homeless and are houseless or have very limited spaces where they're at can no, not really acquire two weeks worth of food to refrigerate and take care of. So then we look at traditional ecological knowledge and we look at how we looked at the history of not refrigerations and how do we, we don't just wake up in the morning as indigenous folks and just go, whoa, what are we gonna eat in the morning? Let's go find something. There's all of these granaries and traps and things that are set up. So within a community, we wanna be able to bring medicine, uh, restoring the land, and then we getting food sources that match um, what we can uh, provide and um, making edible uh, environments, parks, uh, all kinds of spaces during this land restoration to also make them edible spaces, food that's public. All right, so um, for the last uh, um, 12 minutes or so, um, I want to sort of talk about, again, we're in the conceptual sort of phase right now. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of great, I we, we have these ideas, they're, you know, they're, they're logical, they're workable, but there's, of course, a ton of obstacles, right? Um, first of all, economic, we have zero resources. Um, uh, uh, logistical, right? How do we get these things started? Um, what kind of equipment do we need? What kind of uh, you know, partnerships do we need, et cetera? Um, political, um, we t we've talked about all kinds of, you know, we're facing disaster capitalism as we're trying to build disaster socialism, right? Um, and of course, the social and ideological, not the least of which is land access and private property. So um, I'd like to just sort of leave this up here so we can have a discussion. Um, I'm hoping that you know those of you with more experience in in having you know functional cooperatives and stuff can can maybe share some insights as well as to you know how we work around these obstacles in order to you know get from here to there. Um, I'm going to put these. Um, ideas up here, um, you know, uh, it's it's a lot, huh? Can I do a quick? Uh, yeah. I also want to put an invite out there. Yeah. Uh, we have a group here locally that has been working on a humble mutual aid based on the um, uh, the values and principles of the mutual aid disaster relief, just like North Valley mutual aid did during the campfire. Uh, we're going to be meeting April 29th at Outer Space. Does everybody here know where outer space is? Okay. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's approximately seventeen thousand miles in the air. Uh, it's in Arcata. Uh, it's like an, it's like an anarchist collective, much like Blackbird. Yeah. Right. It's basically Humboldt's equivalent. Uh, 
you know, same folks with similar principles. We're going to be, be meeting at 6 p.m. on April 29th over there. Just Google out of outer space, you'll find it. Um, and I just want to invite you all there so that we can continue. We're going to have this discussion now, but this discussion needs to be had by our locals in a local space about how do we address the disasters that we can face and miss uh, the geology that we have here. Uh, so I want to invite you to that April 29th at 6 p.m. And just for anybody who hasn't uh, ever heard of Mutual Aid Disaster Relief and how they got started, they were in response to the Katrina um, hurricane. And their principles are um, you know, based on mutual aid, solidarity, not charity, self-determination, you know, um, the Zapatista movement provided a, a whole lot of groundwork for how to not be a savior in a crisis situation, but how to, uh, it's about power with and not power over, basically. And there's gonna be a lot of really core values uh, that we can go over there as we like have the privilege, frankly, to prepare before the crisis, because we're not in one now. Right. So I just wanted to invite everybody to that while we have that chance. Um, yeah, and, and I used to work in tech support, right? And whenever the, something is broken, and there's all kinds of like obstacles. There's always a workaround. So what we're looking for is workarounds. But um, but yeah, I'll, let's open it up, Margaret. So one thing on the social ideological. Um, I worked in um, drug abuse treatment for a while, and um, one thing that came really clear to me um, through that experience is it, it doesn't just help the the person who's coming to the clinic. It helps the whole community. Because those people, when you help them and get them more stable and help them keep their housing and get their health care and make sure they're eating, um, they're not they're not transmitting AIDS, they're not stealing, they're not um, getting into fights at downtown, um, and all kinds. So I mean, so it helps them clearly, but it helps the whole community, and it's in the community's interest to be supportive of all its members because it, it reduces social disruption uh, on every level. Yeah, and that's really the point. It's like, what can save us from all the things is community. Right, but I mean, this is not, this doesn't occur to a lot of people. Right. So when I ever have the opportunity, I always try to point that out because, you know, it, it isn't, it's actually self-interested to help other people and support your community. But what, what's the, what is the number of someone? and 98 percent of all identified as crime is uh, due to economic inequality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Poverty. Yeah. Poverty. It doesn't care what color your skin is, what uh, religion you believe in. Poverty will affect your community uh, the same as it will any other. It'll destroy it. The punishment is a capitalist thing. The penal system is a capitalist thing. Mm -hmm. And more questions specifically to the, the obstacle? Or, or suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just want to mention that I went to a neighborhood watch meeting in my neighborhood, and I was really kind of offended and blown away. I mean, by the way, I guess it's put on by the sheriff's department, mm -hmm. but it was pretty racist and pretty, um, you know, pretty classist, and also it, the woman was telling me um, going against people's rights and pointing out flaws in the laws. <coughs> Somebody actually has to be in your house before you kill them if they break in your house. And, that kind of stuff. and I was just really, um, I mean, I'm being negative by bringing it up. I just thought it was just a funky little neighborhood organization, and it really wasn't. It really was pretty. Absolutely. That's what we're calling ice cream. The fashion. ice cream fashion. Yeah. We just yeah. want to make our community nice, but there's also yeah. this this pretty overt layer of 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 um, violence. Essentially, violence, xenophobia. Uh, um, I mean, and these are, these are part political um, because these people wield power, and also the the, the uh, ordinances and legislation as it exists is on their side. It's also that social ideological. One of the things we get, um, you were saying about like it benefits the whole community. That's a narrative we keep trying to sell. They say, we shouldn't have to help those people. They should have to pull themselves up by their bootstrap. Right. They're like they're not like Martin Luther King said moons ago, he said, you gotta have fucking boot. Pull yourself <laughs> up by your bootstraps, right? So. Well, there's so much mythology to deconstruct. 
Right, absolutely. It's, it's neoliberalism. Thank well, you and also that. that deep history of colonization right. and, 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 you know, and land taking. Yeah. So you just asking for some suggestions of yeah. what we've been doing here, and I think in order to combat that thing, were you in Eureka or? Well, we yeah, we were just sleepy town. Yeah. Nobody breaks in your house. Well, we've, we've had, generally, we've had some success in, in combating that in a way. I mean, we had a, a political campaign in Eureka where for the city council, and because we have this North Coast People's Alliance, which advocates on issues rather based than based on party and things like that. And so, um, at least in the Eureka race, we, we and then also up in the Northern Humboldt, it wasn't as, uh, anyway, no, the details. But the point was that one of the candidates is pretty much like that whole clean up our town type of routine. And it was just community response in order to like out that and say, look, this is what this guy thinks. He thinks that you should, you know, yeah, it, wait till he your house so you can shoot him or whatever it is. And he had a history of saying this type of thing. And it was based, once people knew that, then you were able to win the election. You know, and so, I mean, it's sure it's electoral and it's not everything. But it's a community effort that is attempting to, to really address those things. So you have to have like a, you know, a team to try to go after those things rather than just be like, oh, I'm going to ignore it because he's an idiot. You're talking about Mantel, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, but, I mean, thankfully, we, you know, there are good forces in the community where, like, you know, when, when a bunch of people came out against the shelter, um, the community was able to mobilize and, and speak out. Um, you know, the, the other thing is that, you know, we're, we're always on the defensive when it comes to things like that. And, you know, I think also being able to advance a vision you know, right, we had a candidate. And, and uh, engage politics tactically, and then, no, yeah. Yeah, exactly. we had a candidate who was positive, so it yep. worked out. You know. David inspired us on that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, um, I know I previously mentioned newspapers and news media, sure. but I guess just in general, um, you know, if in, in situations where the power's out, um, where people may not have their phone chargers, mm -hmm. where different, you know, internet access might be impacted by wildfires also, were there things that worked for you all in order to just get useful information out to people and also be able to communicate to people that might have resources what's actually needed? Um, and then also, I'm assuming there was probably some number of undocumented people um, that were concerned about what might, ha like there were consequences in trying to access those resources. And if there's anything that you found helpful there. Sorry, these are like, can't make these small questions. No so North Valley Mutual Aid uh, broke into like several different working groups, right? So we had like our, our uh, clean up and rebuild groups. We had like people dealing with our, so many people were like emotionally, like uh, just, you know, there was like mountains of clothes and resources, and some people were just so like emotionally crushed that they, like, you know, it was. So there's so many different avenues of dealing with crisis, and and let's be honest, like a lot of people from Adelia and Paradise were not the type of people that agree with us ideolo ideologically, right? Mm -hmm. So multiple different groups had we split into these different groups to tackle all of those different things, and one of them was to create like this culture of communication, right? Because we had all these churches, all these different places, red crosses, no FEMA, uh, but like all these different places where people have gone to, the Walmart camp, right, we were calling it. And so in a situation like that, where you don't have communication, um, we had to do basically the really old fashioned way, which is just physically send people mm -hmm. to those areas. And, and this is what I was doing in the first couple of weeks that I was there. It's like starting to catalog, like, what do they have? What do they need, right? What do they don't need? Because that was a thing. We right. ended up with, like, yeah. more clothes. Totally. <laughs> right. yeah. So you really do need to revert back to, you know, we're not always going to have, um, we're not always going to have that in every situation. So you need to be able to build a quick culture of communication. And humble, we don't have the crisis right now, so we could build that, like, now before something happens. But we were able to do that and, sh and be relatively functional so that, um, you know, when the Red Cross just had way too much stuff or one particular thing or they're missing this, that we were able to get those specific needs from the community 
and maybe deal with the excess of stuff. But you have to build that culture of communication and you can only do that physically. Like even when we did have this, still physically going there and, and doing it was how it happened. We're out of time. We're all very, very approachable people. I can talk. For those who know me, I can talk for a very long time about just about anything. So you want to plot the revolution, find me in the hallway. Let's yeah. Yeah. Um, I, want to give, I want to give the last word to Ali to see if there's yeah. anything that you want to add. Just a second. And... No. Um, I, yeah, I, I definitely want to speak um, truth to power. Um, about the ice cream fascist and the history that we've had in Butte County the last 150 years um, has been pretty brutal and um, I want to reinforce the fact that um, that we cannot forget the past and what has happened in Butte County. What's also happened in Humboldt County was very similar. Similar um, um, basically policies of land seizure and uh, environmental destruction. And so um, we are, we have to resist, um, protect, and love each other, and then repeat that process over and over again. Awesome. Thanks, Ali. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please find us if you want to continue this conversation. Yeah. April, April 29th. Oh, okay. Up space, 6 p.m. We learned, we learned a lot that we can't get into.